sorry for a slight delay. It's eight minutes past eleven now, which has to do with other sessions, uh, mechanisms, constructs, and synergies. <laughs> um, you're here for the session, the framework of the World War Musical, the Five Musical Rights, and I start to introduce. Um, behind the table. Many of you will know them. At the side, I'm a Sobu. I will not start to read his bio. It will take 40 minutes. But he has been uh, in various board functions within the IMC, so strongly connected with the whole idea of the five musical rights. Um, Dick Letts, not uh, known in Australia and worldwide, uh, was also president of the IMC. Also, the defender of the musical rights. And on the other side, Svadiwa Petan, who is uh, the Secretary General of ICTM, the Council for Traditional Music. Uh, and my name is Frans de Ruyter, currently President of the IMC. So, also quite familiar with the defense of the five musical rights. Um, you have found in your program book a short summary of the discussion. Um, about the history of the musical rights in 2001. Uh, and, uh, well, I need not to read it out, you can read it in your program book. What we are going to do is to go to a number of questions around them and perhaps some explanations how they came into existence and what they mean, what they meant in the past and what they mean now and what they could mean in the future. Um, an interesting item further in the discussion will be, and that I can only say because I just come from a session from another organization, the Music Council of Australia, where it was about the future of classical music or classical futures. Uh, and there was an interesting dilemma. Um, the, what was called uh, exposure of music. Uh, which is, of course, very important if we want to support and let music flourish. Uh, we need contact with the media, with contact with the audiences, uh, reaching out to the community. And one of the speakers, a representative of um, ABC, so uh, Australian Broadcasting Corpor uh, Corporation, was um, saying, well, classical music has no exposure or less exposure. The problem is that um, it's just enormous difficult to get the broadcast rights. So we see sometimes heavily subsidized opera companies and uh, orchestras, ensembles, uh, where there is a proper remuneration and recognition of the artists. And as soon as they provide access to it or want to give access to it, uh, and that's one of the other sides of the musical rights. Uh, there come problems because it seems to be too expensive. So there is one of the rights, the proper remuneration, going to step over the other rights, the right to access for all. And that's, I think, an interesting item to uh, come back to in the discussion. But I should like to give now a first floor to Anna Songo, who has prepared a presentation, even with some technology. Uh, on the history and the context of the five musical rights. And I think it is important to have this information before we enter into a discussion or a further explanation. So, Aina, go ahead, please. So, I will just speak a little bit about the background uh, for these rights, how they came about, and what inspired us when we, when we made them. Um, the rights are just to remind us all the right for all children and adults, and then there are several points, three points. First, to express themselves musically in all freedom, to learn musical languages and skills, and to have access to musical involvement through participation, listening, creation, and information. That is the right for everybody. 
and then it is the right for the musical artists, and there are two points there, to develop their artistry and communicate through all media with proper facilities at their disposal and to, work, to obtain just recognition and remuneration for their work. So those are the rights that we set up as the, I would say, the basis, or the, the base, basic framework for the work of the, of the IOC at work. The background, we looked at two legal documents namely the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I think almost all countries and nations in the world have adopted, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is also a UN document, both are UN documents. And then we were inspired by the Charter of Penn International. As you will know, Penn International, which overlooks the right for authors to express themselves freely. And the PEM International will also act if there is censorship um, taking place. Um, I will just show you a few quotes from these documents, the human rights and, and the, uh, the rights of children, just to show you where we in particular found a basis for, for the, the IMC rights. First of all, it says in Article 22, among other things, everyone is entitled to realization of the economic, social and cultural rights indispensable of its dignity and the free development of its personality. Very general thing. Then in Article 27, it says that everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community and to enjoy the arts. There is more, but that's the particular uh, phrase that was important to us. And then in Article 23, it says that everyone who works, this is a general statement, but it should also then include musicians, has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for himself and his family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented, if necessary, by other means of social protection. So these are three very, very important statements that we looked at uh, when we made the five musical rights. Then, from the rights, uh, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, in Article 29, it says that the education of the child shall be directed to, and there are several points, but we quote number A, the development of the child's personality talents and mental and physical abilities to their fullest potential. And of course we, it's implied that, that when we talk about their talents and their mental and physical abilities and to their fullest potential, the potential that also include their artistic and creative uh, potentials. And then in Article 31, states, that should be, sorry, state parties recognize the child, uh, right of the child to, among other things, participate freely in cultural life and the arts. So these are rights which, have, which the, the nations around the world have, have adopted. And there is another one. State parties shall respect and promote the right of the child to participate fully in cultural and artistic life and shall encourage the provision of appropriate and equal opportunities for cultural and artistic recreational and leisure activity. These are rights that the child has. Now from the pen, the pen charter of course is not a binding, in that sense a binding, binding document, but we found some inspiration in that, where it for instance says, in all circumstances, and particularly in time of war, works of art, the patrimony of human at large, should be left untouched by national or political passion. And it also says that PAN, PAN stands for the principle of unhampered transmission of thought. And the third one, and members pledge themselves to oppose any form of suppression of freedom of expression. And we, we then 
think that or say that freedom of expression also includes music. I'll just mention two or three advantages that we saw with these short, the short statements that these five rights represent. Um, they are based, they have a formal base in international conventions, so they are in that sense not debatable. Um, they are easily conceived as an overarching aim for an organization. It's short, it's very clear uh, what this is about, and I think whoever reads these rights will recognize them as something very basic um, internationally. And they have proved, I think, I could say, they, are pro and they should be also useful in advocacy on all levels, locally, nationally, and internationally. So this is just a few words about how, what inspired us and what, what uh, brought us to, to writing these rights. And they have been um, the framework for IMC for about close to 10 years now, I suppose. I, I don't have the exact date, but uh, close to 10 years. So that is what I thought I would give you as a background. Well, thank you, Ayman. This is much useful. And uh, we should remember the text you presented in the discussion. And, uh, you have anything to add on what your feelings are about how these rights have been at, at live within IMC uh, already, or not yet, yeah, or to what extent? I can just briefly say that I think rights have been important in the in the setting up of action plans and, and uh, uh, strategies strategies in the work of IMC ever since they were invented. Okay. May I give the floor now to Big Lance to give his views on the situation. Um, I'm not terribly good at speaking Extemporaneously, uh, I'm going to give it a go. Um, I think the rights, uh, the first thing that struck me about these rights was uh, when I discovered them, was that they give a, a sort of a moral basis for IMC, um, which takes its activities beyond self interest. You know, musicians speaking in their own interest. Um, they show um, the basis for benefit to everyone. And the fact that they're based on uh, UN, in particular UN um, conventions, means that uh, what might once have been endorsed by a religion is now endorsed in, in the secular world through documents that have occupied some of the, the world's best thinkers, presumably for quite a long time, in putting together the best possible statements. I guess you would say that um, the purpose of stating musical rights is to persuade they're not sitting there just as um, uh, nice moral statements, but as principles that we want to persuade others to act upon. Um, and and I, my thoughts are um, just about a couple of angles there. The, The right to self-expression is um, afforded 
basically by governments not um, not breaching, not preventing self-expression. Whereas, for instance, uh, the right to um, uh, a music education requires not just that the government gets out of the way, but that it um, provides for it financially. Um, the actual wording of the of that right is the right to learn. I can I can put it on the People can learn without the government intervening, but in point of fact, at least in Western societies, um, if you don't come from some form of privileged family, you won't get a music education unless the government provides it. Government provision is the way to uh, universal provision of music education. And uh, if these are rights, then, they, then implicitly everybody is entitled to. Um, similarly, the right to the means of communication um, depends on active provision. Uh, I mean, um, you can't broadcast on radio unless there's a radio station to broadcast on. And in as much as uh, I don't think these rights would be, I mean, we're essentially talking about persuading governments, not private corporations, it seems to be. So uh, also there, we're asking governments to provide. Now, if I went to our government and said, uh, you must provide rights to a music education, a proper music education for all the children. Uh, they're going to look to their budgets. And the basis of my persuasion is, uh, well, first of all, I suppose, the, the uh, belief of the, music, the International Music Council in the importance of these rights. The government may, may well ask, well, who's the International Music Council to be telling us how to spend our budgets? And we could then refer to the basis in UN conventions, but I think the answer is likely still to be the same. Um, in fact, even possibly a bit of a resentment that, um, that an international organisation would seek to um, dictate how the government spends its money. So I think as a, what I've noticed is that occasionally now you see in the press somebody say, well, according to uh, UN conventions, probably children have a right to a music education. So it sort of penetrated the, the media sphere in that way, but if you, if you um, use the rights specifically in advocacy, I think it's probably very softly, softly catching monkey because I, I don't think in themselves that uh, they're, going, they're going to actually cause change. They, they give some gravitas to other advocacy but probably can't be the, um, the main point of the Thank you. <laughs> well, there's of course always the difference between signing a declaration and agreeing with certain text and the implementation of the consequences of this. And that's uh, the world where we are in. But I'm coming back perhaps some interesting examples later in the discussion. May I invite my colleague here, the other side, Vandenborg, to refer to this topic and give his feelings on how they are. Uh, I don't know if ICTM has also some, some rights and beliefs and aims and objectives which uh, 
we could learn from, but uh, you as a guest here in the, in the panel and uh, uh, at this moment yet still outside the MC family, it would be good to see what you find about it and especially who you, uh, what uh, being in one of the core members of the Sustainable Futures Project and where these aspects are of course imminent, uh, how you look at this uh, history of the rights and how MC dealt with it. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure and honor to be part of this panel. And one of the reasons why I am here is also to explore actually how we can improve the connections between the IMC and the ICTM. Uh, I think we are thinking uh, about many issues in the same ways. Uh, as I said, I'm, we are probably all familiar with, uh, with the Sounds magazine, which I said that I find so many uh, engaged topics that when I, when I open it, I, I can hardly stop you know, reading before I come to an end. Uh, so this is very good. And of course there are many, many uh, connecting points and I would like to point that I cannot agree more than that. As you said, well, proclamations are nice, declarations are very much needed, but it is actually the implementation that, uh, that makes difference. Uh, but I will try to play maybe like a devil's advocate, if I may, maybe to challenge a little bit uh, about these concepts. Uh, in ICDM, we stopped actually looking at music as an art, or we more and more realized that music is very often a tool that people use or misuse to reach various kind of, of uh, aims. Sometimes they are very positive, but we are also very much aware of very many misuses. And I was lucky to be also at the uh, opening uh, conference of the Free Muse organization that I am seeing is also very much aware of and, and cooperates uh, and, and are very successful with. Uh, so in 1998 it was in Copenhagen. Uh, and then there were many challenging cases, you know, for example, the, it, it was about music and censorship, and Free Muse is about the freedom of musical expressions of, of any kind. Uh, so before I move forward, I would just like to say that one of the things that connects these two organizations very much is the, like in the second one, when you use musical language cheese and skills, so pointing out to the variety. So we are far from that, that we are talking about one single music that is valuable and then the other one being some kind of folklore or whatever, uh, how people sometimes name it. I see it is very much in favor of this, this multiplicity of various musics and this is of course some, some very healthy ground where we can also build our further connections. So let me just give you some examples. In 1998 we were talking about an example from Mauritania where the songs were considered like too erotic you know, for the local consumption. Although they were performed by a female person from Mauritania for example or the musician from Argentina who ended up in the prison for, for various reasons. Uh, then, uh, of course, this extreme interpretation of Islam in Afghanistan or in Sudan uh, and uh, very bad treatment, let's say, to musical instruments. The catastrophe for the musicians, for instrument builders, dancers, everybody who had to leave the country, let's say, from Afghanistan to Pakistan because they, they simply lost the jobs and things like that. Uh, all the way to the Nazi music, you know, to, to the hate music, white power music, and, and, and various other, other categories that may be debatable. So who has right? Who really does really everybody has right to perform or not? Are there any exceptions? Who will put the borders? What is acceptable? What is not acceptable? And, and for what reasons? Uh, you may be familiar, in 2004 there was some, I think it was called a project like uh, Schoolyard, uh, when uh, the, the claim of the, of the organizers was let's well, let's deliver you know this hate music to, to various uh, children and it, our aim is not uh, to uh, to entertain like this uh, the, the children who would who would become skinheads or so but but to create them so this this gives you just an idea about sometimes the strategies that are also behind it of using music. So I come from the territories of former Yugoslavia. You are familiar with the war in Sarajevo. I don't know whether you are familiar that the occupying forces around the city were also using music as a weapon. 
So it was not only that the city was shelled actually from the, from the weapons, but they installed loudspeakers and performed nationalistic songs. So that the people were also terrorized by music. Another example in this reign was of course about the uh, detainees in the Guantanamo prisons and so, which all led actually Susanne Kusik and, and some other authors uh, to write articles about this. I was writing also articles in 1998 about uh, music and war in Croatia, also showing how the detainees were woke up, let's say, in the middle of the night and then forced to sing the national anthem. Or, or, or some other songs that are against their own political leaders or their, their, their cultural authorities. And if they were not singing loud enough and so they were just removed from this life. So, so they, were, they were very, very bad examples of, of misuse of music. Um, and it all led the Society for Ethnomusicology in 2007 to accept the position statement which, which condemns any misuse of music in this case, like music as a tool of torture. And of course, when we talk about declarations, we of course think of music in absolutely positive terms. We think of music, yes, this is a very good tool, for example, to raise the awareness about the AIDS in Africa. There is a book by our colleague Gregory Bars. But of course, we should also be at the same time aware of these uh, other uh, negative, negative sides uh, of it. And if I can add, maybe in my own work also, I, I use music as, as a tool uh, to raise, let's say, awareness, uh, understanding among people who, who were of different cultural backgrounds, who had maybe different even political positions. And uh, I can develop about this maybe a little later, but I can tell you, and also from my colleagues, what I just heard about the session in music and conflict, uh, a management of conflict resolution in some recent books that there are beautiful examples that show this power of music. So if I say that I will play a devil's advocate, it doesn't mean that we don't need the statements about the importance of music and musical rights. We definitely do need. And I'm immensely grateful to IMC for, for creating them. I think it's a very good, good and healthy basis. And then maybe through our scholarly experience also within the ICPM and Society for Ethnomusicology, so probably we can contribute uh, also some of this. So thank you very much, Kalibor, for this uh, wider perspective on the matter. We know a little bit about it, but it's good that you highlighted some, uh, some examples uh, to bring them into the discussion. I had a feeling and I wanted to say something on what just has been said by Svanibor. I saw a hand going up. Well, yes. <laughs> I, think, I think what Svanibor is bringing up is, of course, very, very important and very difficult. And I see very many parallels to everything that has to do with freedom of speech. I mean, there, I think we will all defend the freedom of speech, but there are of course, always limitations. You can use words, you can use speech, you can work, uh, use writing to violate other rights of people. And um, I mean, in, in my country, which is Norway, where we had an awful accident, or well, not an accident, it was a terrible thing about two and a half years ago, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about where is the border, where does the freedom of speech uh, an expression and uh, where do you pass a moral ethical border uh, and uh, I mean there is I think there is no you, you can't write down the solution to that question that's something that has to be negotiated and discussed and, and worked on in uh, any society at any time uh, I also agree absolutely with you when you say that music is not only an art I mean he, he will use the same way as, as the words can be used for arts, but it can also be used for anything else. So, um, but at the same time, I think we will defend basically the freedom to express oneself freely, also with music and, and the other arts. I mean, it's not particular music; it's, it's all the arts, all the all the possible expressions that that human beings have at their disposal. But being very aware of and having to work all the time on these, where are these borderlines between where, where 
your right to violate others and violate themselves. Okay, if you want to react to one of the not yet. Um, before we enter into other uh, discussion points, like uh, if there might be sometimes conflict between uh, the two sections of the rights, uh, or on implementation, are there questions from the audience on the more, let's say, general picture and the historical part? I don't know if we need microphones to be sent around or that you just stand up and take the floor. Deborah, you should like to contribute to what has been said. Okay. Uh, Please okay. stand up and raise your voice or come to the front and okay. use a microphone. That's yeah. perhaps better. Yeah, um, a lot of, a lot of very interesting points. Um, I, I, many things I could say, but I wanted to pick up on Dick saying something I'm a bit perplexed about. Uh, you talked about the fact that it would be a good idea uh, to ensure the, uh, the blanket, I think you could talk about the, the blanket effect of music education for everybody, music being accessible for everybody through governments, uh, because this uh, appears to be uh, one of the ways to ensure this, and uh, you spoke about perhaps your government saying, being a little um, resentful of an international organization um, trying to influence policy. Uh, I would say that governments nowadays are well acquainted with international organizations dictating policy because I don't think any governments are behaving anymore like states governments. They are, from an economic point of view of the world, we're now in that phase yeah, where policy is dictated. I wonder whether really the governments are the right way into this. Um, I'm frightened by how much control also the state has on what is considered music and what not, what is the right music and what's wrong, as Sanibo said. And I wonder whether the way in is actually at the grassroots. Anyone who wants to react, Dick? Well, uh, yes, um, I suppose. Uh, Well, I, I'm thinking of, uh, of the musical rights as an advocacy tool. And um, the first thing one thinks about if it's advocating policy is that you advocate it to the government, not to um, grassroots level civil society. But I mean, I, I certainly uh, agree that if civil society could somehow freely provide the sort of music education that we're talking about, um, in many ways that would be preferable. I just don't see it happening in the countries that I know. Speaking about advocacy and governments, I have a little bit of experience in that. And uh, to quote an uh, interesting example from my own country, which exactly has to do with implementation. I think nobody is against music, and nobody is against music education. The question comes who should pay for it, and then in these five rights, you can say, well, this belongs to music education, and as long as education belongs to the infrastructure of a society, government or public authority, so to say, you're responsible that this is taken care of. If I go to uh, our Ministry of Education, well, say, well, this, this arts education in general, so not specifically about music, music is part of it, uh, should be at the disposal of any child from kindergarten, age three, four, till uh, they reach university status. Um, then is the answer, yes, we agree, and we provide the means for it. And then you see that there are some, some extra sums given to schools indeed um, for this subject. The next step is that uh, schools are autonomous, so they get a kind of lump sum budget. Um, so there comes this little stream of money into the lump sum, then the school is autonomous to, to use that, and then there comes an efficiency budget cut on the whole lump sum. 
and then the poor director of the school has to decide either to give up music education for what he has some money in the budget or to delete a few uh, uh, posts like concierge cleaning, uh, a teacher for sport, etc. etc. So this is a devilish dilemma. Everyone accepts the, the right of the child to receive music or art, artistic education, but the system makes it possible, easy possible, and it, it happens most of the time, that the first thing to go then is art education and not the cleaning, uh, for which can be good reason, out of health and safety, etc. So, uh, and then it's a very difficult discussion on the basis of the five musical rights to go to your government or public authority. Well, you are not doing the right job because the other we did it. Yeah, we cannot help that the school director prefers cleaning over arts education. So this kind of, this will not be the same in all countries. But this is a very strange thing happening, and then you are in big trouble. I don't know if. Uh, one of the panel members of the table has a solution for that dilemma. <laughs> uh, but this is actually the situation in uh, at least the Netherlands. It's a small ink spot on the map, but nevertheless it happens. I know? Yes, of course I have the solution. Uh, <laughs> good. No, but I mean, the, the, the whole idea with these international conventions and documents stating, uh, I mean, basic principles and, and to which the nations agree. Um, I mean, I don't think we can. I don't think we find any convention uh, which has been adopted uh, through the UN system and, and, and uh, taken on board in, in most of our nations, <clears throat> which really uh, is implemented fully. But they are there, and I think that's our, our job, and it's IMC's job to highlight these these rights. Because then they have, they can they can be and they should be and they will be used as as tools as well, I shouldn't say weapons because that's very <laughs> negative but I mean something that we can refer to as civil society I mean it's a civil society which has to put the pressure on the governments and you can I mean so civil society can put pressure on the governments for any anything uh, they want to to put pressure on for but but. Uh, with this in the, in the background, I think we, we are stronger than, than advocate, uh, advocating for any other thing. I mean, because this is something that has been considered by the international society as a very, very uh, basic uh, thing. So it has to, I mean, it's up to us in our countries, in local, on, on all levels, to, to, to use this, take advantage of these these formulations and use them in our, in our pressure towards governments, local and, and, and uh, national governments. But there is no solution to it, of course. Dick? Um, so I, I've been involved with the IMC since 1989, and at some point, <laughs> 10 years ago, I guess, the musical rights uh, were adopted. Uh, virtually without my noticing. <laughs> uh, and then I was president from 2005 for four years, and the musical rights are sort of there somehow. But it somehow occurred to me that I never think of what the Music Council of Australia is doing in terms of musical rights. It just wasn't sort of. Um, Worldview, and uh, so the last thing I did virtually as president was to uh, instigate the musical rights awards, thinking that this might be a way of getting our own members at least to start thinking of what they're doing and what others are doing in terms of the musical rights, and getting the concept to to permeate our world. Um, at least as a sort of a um, part of a world view, a, a murmur in the background somehow, at least of what we're doing. And, and maybe, you know, rather than direct advocacy to governments, there's this initial step that we need that, that we think about our world, we 
you start to live in a world that, to some extent, is shaped by these concepts. This prize has uh, gotten a lot of attention, and it was on purpose that I provided the floor to the Borough Parker, who is representing one of the projects, which is this year's prize winner of the Musical Rights Award. And we will hear more about it tonight at the dinner, picnic under the stars, and the various presentations where the project will be highlighted. Um, others at the table or in the hall who want to speak uh, the, this aspect of uh, implementation and use of it, please stand up and. Uh, I will come in back to this. Uh Solution, you say there is no solution. I think there is one solution, maybe it's more uh, self confidence. So, that when you say there is a teacher or a director from a school that says, okay, uh, we don't have enough money, so we have to uh, cut the sports, why not cut the sports? <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, the arts, uh, it's the same in my country, is just not so. Uh, Self-confidence. They say, okay, sport is more important, this is more important, that is more important. So if there is no money for that, uh, so stand back. Why should we do that? And uh, another point uh, about misuse of music. Uh, if you have more uh, author's rights, the moral rights, uh, then uh, this uh, peculiar music of these authors couldn't be misused. Because um, if you see the publisher contracts, uh, there's written down, uh, you give away everything, and you have no right to speak against the misuse as maybe uh, music for uh, a war advertising film. If you have a strong author's right, this is not possible. You have to go so far to this uh, very, very strong uh, picture together. But in the common life of a composer, you have all the time the situation that your, cut, uh, your rights have been cut down uh, just uh, for uh, uh, one who brings you a music and can be glad to get a little money out of it and has no right anymore. So I think uh, the uh, Central Europe uh, philosophy, the humanistic philosophy of authors' rights, maybe is one of the solutions, in contrary to the copyright idea in the United States, one can uh, do with uh, the music uh, he owns, what he wants. So here, uh, let's say, maybe composers are more moral uh, and humanistic uh, rude uh, persons than publishers. Maybe, uh, hopefully so. Okay? Okay, thank you. Perhaps Farnsworth can comment on this, and if ICTM has ever dealt with the subject in, in this way, the composers' rights, contracts, yeah. publishers, etc. Well, in Europe, in these days, uh, almost every country has some kind of agency that, that takes care of, of, of the rights, right? And very often we find these agencies like counterproductive because the right sometimes limits, like the praxis, musical praxis, really in, in the, on the grassroots level, and prevent actually, let's say, young ensembles performing. And, 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 and so, uh, also, uh, because sometimes, you know, this percentage that you have to pay to the agency is much higher than this, these people would even earn, it would, would be able to cover the, the performance venue. So this, uh, I'm very happy that you raised this question because uh, I think it's, uh, it is something important. But uh, now if you allow me, I would maybe go back to uh, uh, also the previous discussion and say about these uh, financial aspects that are, that are very, very important. And I think we should probably learn from the good practice in various countries. I would emphasize maybe Norway, your country. Uh, because this risk concert and a concept, I, I uh, probably are familiar with this. Uh, this is like one national organization, it exists also or existed in, in other Scandinavian countries. 
uh, that takes care of bringing music to the schools, you know, in, in, in the waste, uh, very far, far, far removed areas, like Norway is an extremely big country. Mm. And, and I found this concept uh, enormously important and, and, and wonderful. And then there are also projects like the, the Resonant Community, something that was uh, going on between 1989 and 92, I think. Also giving this multicultural uh, contents actually to the schools, bringing, let's say, the musicians from Pakistan, from Latin America, from Asia, the countries of immigration to Norway, and then, uh, and then simply providing some uh, children, you know, with the tools of understanding, something that is much bigger than music. Yes, music is used as a tool in the best possible sense of the word, in advocacy. But preparing these children really for, for the world that is not the same as it was uh, at the time of their parents. Uh, so I think this is maybe just one of these very, very nice examples. And of course, I, I know that uh, some of you are just directly involved in wonderful projects uh, like, like Deborah and so uh, that, that really can make this world a better place. And, 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 and uh, I, I cannot be more in favor of, of, of thinking about this uh, in terms of music. And th there is possible probably on behalf of IMC to together maybe the examples of good practice like from different because I see, as I understood, has su such a wonderful network uh, access to, to 150 countries. So I think we can learn enormously a lot uh, from this. Because the musical rights of all the community is very important. Yes, absolutely. So to have confidence in ourselves is a very important aspect, and that's the only way you can, in the end, do your advocacy work in the most convincing way. Um, other reactions from the whole uh, team? Yes, he raised a finger. It is a bit straight in the line to the Timo coming. Clever Timo from Finland. Thank you. And you mentioned over the best practices and you mentioned the big concept. And I, I really uh, would like to stress out the importance of the governmental funding. Of course, the situation in the United States and, and Anglo American countries are very different. Like probably also in Australia. But the fact is that if given one good example of, of model which really seems to work in Finland, is the fact that uh, there's a kind of system in Finland that the funding of the music education is based for the state funding, municipality funding, and the tuition fees. Which means that if the, there's agreement between state and municipalities, if the music schools are going under the hours, which is in an agreement, the state will cut the money, which basically means that it don't make any sense for the municipalities or cities to cut because they just will lose the money. And so it's kind of out of protecting system. Of course, it includes uh, tuition fees, which on law says it should be not too high. It's very vacuum. What, what is high and what is low, it's, it's discussable. But as in a basic fundamental, I think what I'm trying to say is that. I, I think if we want to secure the future of music education, the governments should have a role in this. Yeah, and uh, continuing this uh, contribution, thank you, Timo. Um, what I remember now, and I do not see Hila Mafi here in the hall, is the situation in Switzerland where, by a public vote, arts education is now in the constitution, the national constitution. Uh, which was a battle of 10 years. I do not think that it was all the benefit of the musical rights discussion that exactly <laughs> in Switzerland this has happened. But it was a, a, a continuous uh, advocacy action to, to get the right of music, educa music education, it was not uh, arts education, uh, but music education in the constitution. Although I had intense discussion with Helena, uh, the Swiss Music Council, uh, on the letter, here again, the implementation is a thing because Switzerland consists of a couple of hundred cantons with all their uh, special entries and exits. So now the task of the group is to remember not only the cantons but also really work with the cantons that they implement what the national constitution says, and that's again a quite a way, quite a wrong way to go. But it is good perhaps to speak with her. She is here around. Uh, this, uh, 
behalf of EMU here, European Music School as a union, uh, and um, uh, to speak with Helena about this uh, advocacy campaign. But indeed, if you take away the money as soon as you don't do it, that's best because then it doesn't bring anything. Uh, Anna? Yes. <coughs> I have to go on a session. <laughs> in another building. <laughs> that you get with seven conferences at the same time. Um, I think we need to make it clear to ourselves that, I mean, these, <clears throat> these formulations, there is no direct li line from, from these principles to a particular solution. In our countries, I mean, there are. Uh, it is. It is up to us to, to find our solutions in, in each uh, in each country and in, in each community. I think IMC's role is twofold here. I mean, it's uh, manifold. But, uh, there's, um, highlighting two two aspects. One is, of course, to, to, to highlight these rights, to flag them, to remind ourselves and and our authorities that these are basic rights uh, which uh, we, they are responsible for, for, for implementing in one way or the other. That is the one thing. And the other aspect uh, from, from the point of IMC is, as you have touched upon now, that, that is that we can support each other in our struggles to find the best solutions in each country. And that we do that in many, in many ways, of course, and one way is that we, that we share with, with each other solutions that we have found which, are, which may seem to be good, um, without imposing anything on, on each other, of course, but uh, to make that information available. So these two aspects, which go hand in hand, in my view, with the principles and the sharing of, of, uh, of information and, and, and supporting each other. I mean, that's the whole idea with, with, with all the international organizations. It started with, with the UN after the, after the war. And um, is, in, in particular, that the strong support the weak, which I think is, is very, very important. I, I want to come to... Uh, uh, we will have more questions uh, in the course of the discussion. We still have half an hour. To uh, an aspect I want to highlight and I spoke about that at the beginning, that there is a possible situation of conflict between the two blocks, the access block and the recognition and remuneration. Uh, and as a festival director for 15 years, I have really had a situation that it was highlighted this morning in the other place, where you have a wonderful product, uh, and you should like to spread this out to give more access of people to that product, a concert, a performance, an opera, uh, a theatre play, uh, and you do that mostly through media, which is broadcast, radio, television, and the negotiations about uh, third rights, fees, are in the end not successful, so to say. Which means that, um, well, it will not be spread out through the media, radio, television, and the performance takes place and there are 100 to 2,000 visitors who see it. So this is a kind of limited access because you lose the opportunity to reach 100,000, 500,000, 2 million other people who through the media could get access to that subject. The same is even for just organizing a concert where you have a brilliant idea as far as repertoire is concerned and it is enormously important to say, well, it is now about time that our audiences are learning about this repertoire. It's unknown, it's special, it's new, it's old, and, but for that repertoire you need a certain type of artist or a certain ensemble or orchestra. Uh, and given often the limited scope or limited budget of uh, organizations, in the end your negotiations with the artists fail because the price simply stays too high which means that the audience get, does not get access to that content, to that kind of repertoire. Um, 
I would like to ask uh, Ivar, who was uh, at the basis of <laughs> this idea of musical rights, uh, how this has developed this idea? What was this a discussion point? Um, the, the, the secret of the discussion is a bit in the word proper. It says uh, just attribution and uh, yeah, it, or, or just, obtain just attribution and remuneration. Sometimes we say, and uh, speaking about also proper facilities. So these words, proper and just, uh, how, how do we evaluate them? How do we put them on the balance? Uh, uh, what is the weight, what is the, what is the weight of these words, the proper and just? Where are you beginning and where are you ending? And where are you sitting in the middle? Or, was this considered? How did the discussion go? And what is your feeling about how this has worked out? Hmm. Um, I mean, what the rights here say, and what the rights say, I mean, the, the basic rights in, in which I showed before, is that people who do a work should have the remuneration which is fair, which gives them a, a chance actually to, to survive, to live. As, as provider of whatever services it, it is. And that is what we would, I mean, that we need to argue for and, and, and work for towards. Um, but of course we are, we are in music as in very many other fields, we are in the marketplace where there is um, some, some, I mean, you can sell yourself if, if, if there are people who, want to, who are willing to pay a high price for, for a service, then people will sell it for a high price. I mean, that's, that is all over all, the whole scope of, of, uh, um, of uh, professions. And uh, I don't think we, cannot, we can't maybe fight that, but what we need to fight for is that there should be a fair Payment of fair remuneration for for work, but that this is a that there is there are conflicts. Of course, there are, there are conflicts between these various rights. Um, I mean, life, life is full of conflicts. <laughs> yeah, interesting is the word survive you mentioned, and this comes from the conventions. But yeah, what is the appreciation of survival? <laughs> well, I. I'm not an expert in this, so I have walking in Norway. I have survived with a normal state salary. <laughs> no, I don't think there is a. I, I don't think there is a answer to that. No, I don't think that is a criteria. I mean, there is, there are, I've been involved in big discussions about what is poverty. I mean, when, how low do you do you have to go in income to describe yourself as as poor? And uh, that seems to be a relative thing. I mean, you can make, you can not be poor in one country when a, when a, with a particular income, but if you take that income and move to another society, you will be poor. Is there any reflection from your side on this debt dilemma and possible conflicts? I can say that it should be left in relative terms so that it can be uh, adjusted and uh, used in different countries because we are talking about globalization, we are talking about uh, free movement of people uh, across borders, but we know that this is not really the picture of the world in which we live. And uh, also I think for, for this meeting, so that there were people who were unable to get visas even, even to enter the country. Uh, well, my wife being one of them. <laughs> so so it, it just depends what kind of passport you have sometimes. Whether you have a wrong passport or, or, or that one that will entitle you to get it maybe in two hours or two days. So it depends. Uh, so I think uh, it, it's good to leave it open in this way. And uh, catching this word poverty, this is I think also something that we should, we should keep in mind. And maybe I would like just to call your attention. Uh, the ICPM uh, publishes this, uh, this is our major publication, which is called Yearbook for Traditional Music. And uh, the theme uh, in this volume is music and poverty. This is the topic. 
So uh, with this, I would like to tell you how actually we are thinking in, in, in the same way about, about these things, about the, the things that are relevant for us to discuss uh, in, 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 the, in the current world. And there are many examples, also good practice here, how to deal, what, what are the aspects, what relates music and poverty. And I think this is, the, this is for example, the topic that we were, we were waiting for. And uh, I think it's, it's good to have it, it's a good food for, for thought. But when we talk about these conflicts, I would like maybe to point to one that I found very often in the practice. It is not about uh, one right against the other, but about a different interpretation. Are we talking about the freedom of artistic uh, creativity or are we talking about something that is maybe very much against, let's say, members of certain groups? For example, there was a CD that was created in Slovenia some time ago uh, and uh, the cover of, of this CD showed like Madonna with, with little Jesus and then the artist replaced the Jesus with the rat. With the? Yeah, rat. You know, then, and uh, so, of course, many religious people found it very much offensive. And then those who, who did this piece of art, or you can call it piece of art, quote unquote, whatever, so, of course, they claim, no, 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 we didn't mean to, to, to do anything against anybody. You know, this is our freedom of, of, of artistic expression. So I think this is the kind of situation that we, that we find very often today when there are different values, just like different standards in different parts of the world. Uh, and so the, these are the concrete problems that sometimes we have to deal with. Any comments from the floor on this subject of conflicts between one right and the other? Deborah, was your remark, you asked things for in this direction, or? It's a survival, but it's not doing things Anyone on this situation of conflict? Yeah, I just want to point out uh, this is not necessarily a conflict. Access to music and get a fair innovation. Please explain. <laughs> Please explain. No, um, you can come to the front and use the microphone. Mm -hmm. Then it will be recorded and it will be. Filed for history. <laughs> access for, accessible for everybody. <laughs> we will get a fair remuneration. So, Harald from Austria, Vienna. Um, I think the, uh, the, the five musical rights are very important um, to integrate. Um, the uh, advoca advocacy work of um, uh, musical um, organizations. They have um, uh, interests. They have uh, uh, not only the, uh, the same interests. So uh, in, in this uh, formulation of the five musical rights, you can uh, have on maybe on the national level, um, a, a campaign, uh, campaigns who are, uh, uh, um, from, from the field of the music education and also from the field of the uh, music industry. So they can, can come together on the basis of these five musical rights. And I, I think that's the, uh, the, the strong possibilities of these uh, musical rights. So, um, to, to have access to music or to spread access of music uh, is, is not necessary in contradiction to, to get a fair remuneration for, uh, for a musical work. So, not necessarily, uh, but no. when, it, when it happens, you have a kind of a conflict. I gave a few examples. I failed from time to time to come into terms on the basis of what I found proper and just, and the other party did not find proper and just, and we had a discussion on proper and just, but the end result was no contract and less access. So for me that was a conflict. 
Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of the rights, of course. I will defend them everywhere. But I had that conflict. Not one time. time. But we yeah. discussed uh, this in, in uh, several other panels. Yeah. So the, um, now we have the, the most um, uh, widespread access to, to mu music uh, in history uh, through the internet. So, and with a lot of problems. Yeah, with a lot of problems. And a uh, lot of musicians who... Um, in the field of uh, uh, remunerations of the, of the authors. Yeah? Yeah. So that's unsolved problems. Yes. There are conflicts. Yeah? Uh, but not necessary. That was, that's, not that's, that's what I want to say. That was not necessary, but there are options for conflict. Dick, who has just arrived <laughs> back <laughs> and is new to the subject now, yes. immediately <laughs> wants to floor. Please go ahead. Yes. Say anything. <laughs> uh, well, uh, one thing that strikes me about this is that there would be no discussion of these uh, conflicts or edges had we not already stated that there should be, for instance, freedom of expression. So it's part of the civil society, um, the way it operates, is that uh, there's always going to be uh, a point at which this dispute or discussion, or you know, uh, how free should the expression be? Uh, what level of music education is, is considered enough? How much access to the media is, is enough? And if we didn't have the statement of rights, then we wouldn't be having those discussions. <laughs> That's a good philosophical concept. <laughs> So we are now about 75 minutes in the discussion. Uh, I would like to invite the audience to come with uh, general remarks on the various topics that we handled and uh, also the plan of the IMC at least to uphold these five musical rights in the future, as I'm well informed. So we try to go on with it. Um, uh, you can trust us. This advice to the new board of the IMC to also chanting for these rights. But there might be very few remarks. I see Sonia and then Deborah again and then you and Celia. So we have four speakers. They, if they could come to the front and uh, there is a microphone now, a loose one, so it needs. Okay, I, I want to come back to this last question because I, I think on the one hand it's the same kind of conflict that we were talking about before, where do the rights of one person end and the rights of the next person begin, like with the freedom of expression. So I think with any right, you will find a limit to the right because you are touching somebody else's right. So if I'm talking about the right of access, obviously, if I believe in copyright issues and in remuneration, I must come to a point where my freedom of access hits with the right of the, of the musician. Now, there can be mechanisms that can bridge this. This is when you get state funding, for example, to uh, allow access, free access, and musicians still being paid. And I think this is often a question of, to take a non-musical example, I'm enormously impressed here in Brisbane to see how many free services are offered to the people by the city. I go here to the South Bank, I can go swimming for free, I have clean showers for free, I have toilets for free everywhere, ne nowhere do I have to pay. That doesn't mean that these things aren't costing anything. It means that the city is investing in offering this free service to the people. And the city can decide to offer free music and free access to music and they are the ones paying for it. Or I have a foundation bank. So I think that that's, but what is good about that is that it actually raises the awareness that if I offer free access, there still has to be payment. And when I discuss with young people today, that's what I find frightening, is that young people are not even aware of their own rights when creating things, because they grow up in a society where, where this isn't being discussed. So, so my nephew is not aware of the fact that if he writes a story, he owns the rights of this story, and a friend of his cannot simply publish it under his name. And that's why I think it's still important to, to keep the rights, even if they are conflicting, because they create a certain awareness um, for the necessity to discuss these things and to find where the borders are right. I think that's what you mean, Hans. So, um, 
when somebody is charging uh, 10,000 euros for half an hour, then we probably think there's something wrong and it's not a fair remuneration anymore, it's a more than fair remuneration. So that, that's what we have to find out and we have to try to see who can help to bridge those gaps. That's very wise. You can give the microphone to Deborah and then after our Austrian colleague and then Celia. Um, I, I guess I'm feeling a little Palestinian, maybe Arabic, in this moment because a lot of the discussion is taking place about something which is, sounds fairly Eurocentric. Uh, it's to do with musical production, it's to do with music industry, strange word, uh, coming from the context in which I'm working and the context which will be discussed when I present my project. Um, and somebody has mentioned music as a weapon, uh, but then said, no, we don't want to call it that, it's too strong. I think we should call it that, actually. There are good weapons. I think these music rights are fantastic, and I think IMC is showing that it doesn't only work in a Eurocentric area, certainly in awarding my project with the prize. Um, it has, it surprised me. <laughs> no, I never, we never imagined that this would happen. And it shows an attention to music being used in a very different context. And I think music is survival. I think it is one of the basic needs. And it becomes very evident that it's not when you're talking about a civilized European society where there is state funding and where we have an education system in place and everybody has a passport and can move. But it becomes very, very clear in a situation like the Palestinian refugee camps of Lebanon, where there are no rights and nobody can move, nobody has a passport, uh, nobody is recognized as a citizen. Music becomes the baseline for survival in these situations. And I have understood how dangerous a weapon it is when talking with the Director General of our um, Palestinian partner, uh, which is uh, an NGO working inside the camps, when he said to me, you know, Deborah, uh, a project like ours, which is the, the mission of which is to develop children, not only in music, but in all the arts, the education and the social and health care, to become full, creative uh, people who are aware of their own agency in the world. Um, is very dangerous and is viewed as uh, a, a great danger by the militant um, armed groups in the camps who don't want children to grow up with that kind of creativity and that kind of ability to adapt and to find harmonious solutions to their problems. We are a big, big threat and I think probably at a world level, uh, in a world which is going towards, which is still on this capitalist uh, um, crazy journey that's, uh, I don't know where it's going to end up. Um, music and the creative arts are one of the most powerful uh, weapons that we have for uh, maintaining our individuality and also maintaining the common basis of humanity. And I am very grateful that the, uh, that the IMC shows that it is uh, aware of this. Thank you very much. Duly noted. As a moment I end to this very wise uh, and thankful uh, thoughts that you shared with uh, us now. Uh, I think the human rights uh, declaration that is the basic of that uh, was formed because the human rights have been in a very bad shape. And uh, this, I think, we uh, have to recognize is just the bottom. This is the bottom rights we have to save. The discussion, uh, if there is perhaps a, a proper uh, remuneration uh, like uh, a star singer, uh, is not a really conflict. So it's a, a point of the market price. And I think maybe it's also not a proper facility uh, that disposes that everybody has to have a Stanley piano. He has to have a piano and has the right to have one, but not to have the luxury. So I think this is not really uh, a conflict, it's a, a conflict uh, of rights, it's a conflict in the market. But this is a quite different uh, discussion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and my name is Paul Hatton from Vienna. Yeah. 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 Uh, Sylvia, uh, you asked the floor uh, up here, up there. Yes, thank you very much. I will be very short. I think something that at least um, a group of IMC people 
um, have suggested uh, over the past years is to actually add one word in the formulation of the rights. And I think we have already used it quite a lot, even if it's not written. And that's in the last right, which says now to obtain just recognition and remuneration for the work. I think there is a suggestion to include the word fair remuneration for their work because, well, the IMC has been for a few years a uh, project partner in something called uh, the Fair Music Project, the Fair Music Initiative, which was exactly about creating, actually introducing the um, fair trade principles into the music business to develop standards uh, for venues that uh, would uh, welcome uh, artists um, so that there are standards in the contracts how artists are treated uh, in these venues or how uh, recording contracts are being made, develop those standards in order to ensure some kind of fairness in the music business. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a thing to consider, not to decide in this meeting. Uh, I have the feeling that we are slowly coming to an end of the discussion. Is there anyone who likes to speak at the moment? If not, I would like to ask my panel members if they have a last note, a question mark, an expression of great enthusiasm, and then if that's not the case, I want to thank you for your participation. I especially thank Einar for his uh, uh, preparation and the powerful presentation which uh, sets the ground for the whole discussion. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful introduction to the whole thing and the other panel members for their wise words and I think there is a kind of general agreement on going on with this and um, to choose the right words when we use uh, things like conflict and fair and just and to put it in a good perspective also on a philosophical basis. Uh, thank you very much for being with us.